This morning, I want to turn your attention again to Acts chapter 3. Uh, this is a very familiar passage of Scripture. It was read earlier in the service. I want to read it again, and then I want to say something about this pericope. Acts chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. Would you please stand with me as we read the Word of God? Acts chapter 3, beginning with verse 1 through verse 10. Very familiar. Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask for alms from those who entered the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms. And fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, Look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, silver and gold I don't have, but what I do have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered into the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. Then they knew that it was he who sat begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. This is the word of God. Please be seated. I want to tag this text, men who make a difference. Men who make a difference. The intent of this message this morning is to encourage men of faith especially those who have been transformed by the power of God, you're saved. I want you to know this morning that the Word teaches that you have inherent in you the power to make a difference in the lives of the people that God allows to cross your path. You have the power to make a positive difference in your family, in your church, in your community, in the country, and in the global community. You have been gifted by God with the presence of the Holy Spirit who is at work in you and who works through you. You have been providentially placed where you are in life right now by the grace of God in order to start where you are in order to do what God has empowered you to do. Let's look this morning at the first 10 verses of Acts chapter 3. And for our consideration, we want to lift these two men who has moved out of the confinement of the church and into society where they encounter a brother in need. When we look at who they are, Peter and John, and what they did, their action is designed to help us to understand how God has qualified and equipped us to become men who make a difference. I've outlined this pericope in three sections in order to help us to move through it. First, there is a note on the importance of persistence in prayer. The second movement describes the pathology of the paralysis of this man who was laid at the gate. And the third talks about the power of God through the life of his men. Acts chapter 1, chapter 3, verse 1. We find Peter and John on their way to the temple for the afternoon prayer. Josephus in his Antiquities, tells us that there were three times in the life of the Jewish man for prayers. There was an early morning prayer, and then again at the ninth hour, which is around 3 o'clock in the afternoon, 
And then the evening oblation at sunset, at sunset, when the sacrifices are offered in keeping with Exodus chapter 23, verse 39. These two disciples, these men whose lives had been transformed by the power of God, has shown persistence in prayer. In Acts chapter 2, the opening verses, verses 1 through 4, we find Peter and John in the upper room praying and waiting for the power of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 2, in the closing scene, verses 42 through 44, we find Peter and John engaged in the ministry of the word in fellowship and in prayer. And then here in the opening verses of chapter 3, Peter and John are again on their way to the temple at the hour of prayer. What are you suggesting here? That they are persistent in their prayer life. Men who make a difference are men of prayer. Every man in Scripture that we read about who has made a difference has been a man of persistent prayer. Moses prayed. Abraham prayed. David prayed. Solomon prayed. Elijah prayed. Daniel prayed. Isaiah prayed. Jesus prayed. Peter and John were persistent in their prayers. Every man in our contemporary time who has made a difference has been a man of prayer. Malcolm was a man of prayer. Martin was a man of prayer. And Marcus was a man of prayer. Just to name a few. Men who make a difference are men who are persistent in their prayers. And there are men here and men listening to me today who have been persistent in your prayer, and you have experienced a measure of success in your life, you have glorified God in your life simply because you know the worth of prayer. You have been persistent in your prayer life. You have an active and healthy prayer life right now. You know from experience the benefits and the blessings that come through prayer. Prayer is serious work. Prayer is work for men. Men who make a difference are men who know how to pray. Prayer places us as in a place of privilege, a privileged position as sons in the presence of God our Father. It's like a son approaching the Father. We receive counsel and clarity from God in prayer. In prayer, we appeal to the one who hears and answers our requests and our inquiries. He knows the beginning and the end of a thing, and we pray to a God who reveals his plans to us in his perfect time by his perfect methods. We know how to wait on God in prayer. Prayer is important. Prayer has power. In prayer, we enter by faith into the presence of the one who loves for us is supreme and who is sovereign and who is solid and who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power at work in us. Prayer places us in a privileged position. And then prayer gives us the proper perspective on power, doesn't it? The world's power, the world's way of demonstrating power is through bombs and bullets. The world's way of demonstrating power is through militarism and might and force. But God demonstrates his power through his spirit. Governments have power over certain geographical locations, but our God reigns supreme. He has power over all, and we come to grips with that in prayer. In the text, in Scripture, Rome had power to crucify, but God has power to raise from the dead. God has the power to move mountains in your life. He has the power to steal storms that are raging in your soul. He has the power to give of life in death situations. Prayer puts us in touch with the ultimate source of power. 
That's why when you pray, you don't have to worry. And if you're going to worry, just forget about prayer because there is power in prayer. Prayer puts us in a privileged position in the presence of God our Father. Prayer helps us with our perspective of power so that we know that it's not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Zechariah said that. And then prayer paves the way to progress, doesn't it? Through prayer, God gives us directions and directives. That's why you ought to ask God before you make that move. And then wait for the answer before you move. Because God will give you directive and he will give direction if you wait long enough. You have to ask him. My brothers and sisters, John says in his epistle, you have not because you ask not. And you ask in prayer. Prayer, prayer paves the way for progress. Prayer can open doors of opportunities that are currently closed. Somebody has a witness this morning, a testimony this morning, that a door was closed until you talk to God about it. And God in his own way and in his own time opened that door that was previously closed. Have I got a witness this morning? Is there somebody can testify, man or woman, that God has a way of opening doors? Amen. Prayer can change the hearts of your opponents so that they will bless you and don't even know why. Amen. Amen. You know what? Don't go to battle with your enemies. Pray for them. Amen. God can change your heart and God can change your attitude. In the midst of it all, God is the one who can make a difference and that difference comes through prayer. Prayer gives you courage to persevere in your pursuits. Yeah, life has a way of beating you down. Prayer gives you the courage to stand up to opposition, to persevere in your pursuits. If you get knocked down, prayer will pick you back up and put you back in the game. You have to learn how to pray. Prayer, prayer, prayer will give you courage to persevere in your pursuits. Prayer will help you stay focused on your vision despite the distractions and disruptions and the disappointments. Men who make a difference are men who know something about prayer. Men who persevere in their prayer life. These two men in the text that we encounter in Acts chapter 3, verse 1, two men, they were coming out of private prayer and having received power, they are on their way to the place where prayers are made publicly. They were persistent in their prayers. Powered by prayer. Prepared by prayer. The text says that on their way, they, made, they met a man with a pathology of paralysis. Men who were persistent in prayer leave their private prayer place on their way to make public prayers and God placed in their path on their way a man with a pathology of paralysis. Look what happened when men who are filled with the Holy Spirit and who are persistent in their prayer meet a man with a pathology of paralysis. Look at verse 2. A certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask for alms from those who entered the temple. The paralytic congenial difficulty was centered in his feet. He was lame with paralysis in the base of his heels, of his feet, in the socket of the ankles. Luke is a doctor, and the language that he uses describes 
the paralysis. The bones were out of place from birth, and he was not able to walk. His only livelihood was the merciful charity of people on their way in and out of worship in the temple. In the text, the man's lameness is literal. He was physically lame. He is literally lame. But this lameness is also a metaphor for three types of paralysis that we find in some men today. It's a, it's a metaphor. It, it, is, it, is, it describes types of paralysis. The first type is a psychological paralysis. This man's mind and thinking has been shaped by the social pressures that he is under. He was born lame and has been conditioned to think like a lame man. He, he lives where lame people live under conditions that are designed to keep them lame. The condition is designed to keep him in place. He is bound by psychological chains that he is unable to break free from. He is a man who has learned to become accustomed to receiving welfare as an acceptable lifestyle alternative. He is lame. He's a boy in a grown man's body. He's lame. He's learned to depend on other people and have accepted that as an acceptable lifestyle for a grown man. He is psychologically lame. It's a paralysis. But he's also physically lame. This metaphor is one of physical lameness caused by extended periods of paralysis. In other words, he is handicapped by his negative self-concept, which renders him unable to move out of his condition. He doesn't think enough of himself in order to move out on his own. Lord have mercy. He's physically lame. Because he has never used his own strength, he thinks he's supposed to be carried by other people. I'm just talking about what I'm talking about. You've seen him. Nothing but talk. All he does is begs, complains, and criticizes. He's stuck. He's lame. He's lacking inner strength and willpower to propel himself. He's been carried all of his life. He has a pathology of physical lameness. But then thirdly, he's spiritually lame. He's spiritually malnourished. That he has a life that is not God-centered. He's unaware that he has been made in the image and after the likeness of God. He does not know that God loves him and that God has a plan to redeem and to restore him. The spiritually lame has no devotion to God. It's a life without faith, a life without prayer, a life without hope. The spiritually lame is a life without worship, without thanksgiving, and has no generosity. There is no praise in his heart because the Holy Spirit is absent from his life. The spiritually lame are without Christ, aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Lame. Now, you probably know some people affected by this lameness today. 
They live with the pathology of paralysis. As a matter of fact, my brothers, all of us at one time were infected with this lameness until we met Jesus. Who through his grace and through his mercy made us alive in Christ, who broke the chains of bondage and gave us the gift of the Holy Spirit and power. Who caused us to become at least potentially Men who make a difference. Look at those who carried him to this place every day. This man is carried every day by people who placed him at the elaborate opulence of the Corinthian gate of the temple. The most beautiful gate of the temple. Luke calls it the beautiful gate. It's almost a crude paradox that this man is placed at the place that is supposed to represent God in the midst of his people, but all he can see is money. The place where God meets his people, but there is no power to heal. The power of God does not reside in things. It does not reside in buildings. It does not reside in silver or gold. The power of God in this world today resides in people. The power of God in the world today resides in people. This man is carried every day and laid at the gate called Beautiful. But on this day, he saw Peter and John approach the gate, and he was attracted to them immediately. I want to think that the radiance of their countenance outshone the gold and silver of the gate. Because men who make a difference make a difference. Amen. Let's look at verses 3 through 8. Who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple... Asked for alms and fixing his eye, Peter fixing his eyes on him with John said to the man with the paralysis, look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, silver and gold I don't have, but what I have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And when he did that, immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he stood leaping up and stood and walked, entering the temple, walking, leaping, and praising God. For the lame man, the power of God in the life of Peter and John was visible. The power of God, it was visible. Amen. This man saw a lot of people coming and going. He had laid by that gate a lot of days. But on this day, a few days after Pentecost, when some men had been filled with the Holy Spirit and who had been persistent in their prayer life because they were filled with the Spirit and prayerful men, something about their exterior, something about their presence, was changed. And when this lame man saw them, he saw something different. Amen. And, and what Peter and John had in them ha- had gave them the, uh, the courage to say to the lame man, hey, look at us. That can, in other words, we're men just like, we are not better than you. We're not better than you. We are not holier than you are. We are men. We are, um, we are men just like you, made of flesh and blood. We are prone to make mistakes. Sometimes we misspeak. We are not perfect, but our lives have been touched. Our lives have been transformed by the power of God through our faith in Jesus Christ. And that's what you see. My brothers, how we carry ourselves, what we say, make a difference. 
A transformed life is like a light that shines in the darkness. There is something about a man who has been redeemed and reconciled and restored by the power of God. The restored image of God is visible in you. You speak true principles of the word of God. You have compassion of God residing in your spirit. You are driven by the passion that God has given you to serve and to love and to help your fellow human being. That's the power of God that flows through you. Look at Peter and John. They're not driving expensive chariots. They're not wearing flashy jewelry. They're not dressed in, they are dressed in common clothing of the day. My brothers and sisters, misled and misguided people have been taught that the evidence of a godly experience is material possession and political power, and that's a lie of the devil. The evidence of godly favor is his gift of wisdom in your life, your ability to think and act, being led of the Holy Spirit, using your knowledge and your experience and the understanding that God has given you with common sense and godly insight. And all of these gifts come in relationship with God, and they are all residing in men who make a difference. Relationship with God is possible and perfected through Jesus Christ, whom the Father has made both Lord and Christ. First of all, the power of God is visible in you in the life of the man who makes a difference. And then the power of God is verifiable. Now, a study of the language that Luke uses and describing this scene helps us to understand that what Peter and John did that day was a continuation of what Jesus did in his ministry. It's verifiable proof. And I know you asked me, where did you get that? That's a good question. If you look at verse 7, the language that he uses, and he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. I want to put a pause right there because I want you to know that it is the name of Jesus and the action that was taken that caused the healing. He didn't just say, in the name of Jesus, rise and walk and walk past him. Yeah. He didn't just say, be blessed, and kept going. He said, in the name of Jesus, rise and walk. And he reached out his hand, caught him by the right hand, and lifted him up. And that phrase, lifted him up, is the same phrase that is used in Jesus' ministry on at least three occasions which causes one to read this and verify that it was the power of God that raised up this lame man. The first time we see it is in Mark chapter 1, when Jesus healed Simon Peter's mother-in-law, who had a fever. The Bible said he went to her house, and he took her by the hand, and he lifted her up. The second time we see it is in Mark chapter 5, verse 41, where there was a boy, a child, whose father had brought him to Jesus, and the boy was possessed with a demon. And when Jesus told the demon to go, the demon convulsed the boy, and everybody thought that the boy was dead. But the Bible says that Jesus took the dead child by the right hand, or the dead girl by the right hand, and lifted her up. And then in chapter 9 of Mark, Jesus lifts up a boy by the right hand. Sorry, in Mark chapter 5, he takes a dead girl by the right hand. In Mark chapter 9, he takes a dead boy by the right hand and lifts him up. When Peter took the lame man by the right hand, that was proof of God's power in his life. Look at how God did it, brothers. It was through the helping hand of another brother. God still wants to use your hands. 
to demonstrate his power in somebody else's life. Somebody say amen. Give somebody in need a hand. Amen. Somebody who needs help needs you to give them a hand. Amen. A helping hand to fulfill a need. God involves, get involved in the name of Jesus with your hands, with your presence. Some young man needs a hand. Some young family needs your hands. Some community project needs your expertise. Some church program needs your presence. God still demonstrates his power through your hands. Finally, we see that God is victoriously glorified through men who make a difference. This man's life was changed and transformed. His condition was healed. He got a new lease on life, all because some prayerful brothers filled with the Holy Spirit and the power of God reached out and touched his life in a personal way. The last thing, the last time we saw this man, he was alive. He was relieved of his pathology of paralysis. He was walking. He was leaping. He was praising God, and he was on his way into the temple to prayer with those brothers that made a difference in his life. This last thing, and I'm, I'm finished. In the final analysis, what are we called to do if we're going to make a difference? What we ought to do, I want to capture in the words of the late Reverend Dr. A. Lewis Patterson who was the pastor of Mount Corinth Church in Houston. He died in 2014. He said in one of his noted sermons that if you want to make a difference, you need to do three things, and we find them in the text. Start where you are, wherever you are, wherever God has placed you in your life, you can start right there. On the job, start right there. In the academy, start right there. In your home, start right there. Start where you are. Number two, use what you have. (laughs) That's simple, isn't it? Start what you are, use what you have. You might not have much. It might not seem like much to you, but we know over and over again in the scripture, if you take your little bit to Jesus, he can take your little bit and do a lot with it. Start where you are, use what you have, and then do what you can. That's easy, isn't it? You can remember that, can't you? Start where you are, use what you have, do what you can. We know that that's what Jesus did. He started in that time before time. He was born in a Bethlehem manger. He lived with power of God, touching those who had need. He died on the cross. His hands were nailed to the cross. And when he had done all he could, he dropped his head in the locks of his shoulders and he gave up the ghost. But then early that Sunday morning, God showed up with power and raised him from the dead. And that power, my brothers and sisters, is available to you today. For those of you who trust in God, you can start where you are. You can use what you have and you can do what you can to turn somebody's life around. Come on, why don't you give God some praise this morning?